If you've been keeping a close watch on 2020 election reporting, first, deep breaths, you're doing great. Second, maybe you've noticed a new word here and there, Upside. Upside is used in finance to describe the chances a stock will see big gains. In 2005, you might have said Google had a good upside. It also has significance in sports, fantasy sports in particular. A player with big upside has a likelihood of posting monster stats. They're likely to hit home runs off a certain pitcher or score multiple touchdowns against a particular defensive line. There's a chance, given some set of circumstances, they could outperform. When someone like Chris Saliza says a political candidate has big upside, it means that as circumstances shift, their chances of being elected could improve dramatically. It means they have potential. The intrusion of sports argo into politics is nothing new. This goes as far back at least as Shakespeare when King Henry V tells his soldiers, I see you stand like greyhounds in the slips, straining upon the start, the game's afoot. Thomas B. Littlewood charts the history of politics as competition in the U.S., reporting it as a horse race, as you may have heard, in his book Calling Elections, The History of Horse Race Journalism. But Upside is the latest in an ongoing incursion of not just sports language, but statistics-related language often associated with fantasy sports leagues, and in some ways, gambling. This practice rests upon the availability of data gathered from constituents through polling. Those polls are often used to answer the burning question on everyone's mind, who will win? Elizabeth Warren, Donald Trump, Andrew Yang. This conversation drives election reporting today. Who will win and by what data-backed metric can that claim be justified? Look at this chart. Gaze upon this sea of color-coded maps. And this is why political reporting and polling are increasingly entangled. In this video, we're going to talk about how that happened, in the states at least, and the impact it's had on how we understand politics. Namely, the horse race approach frames politicians as players in a game and constituents as spectators, rather than each as participants in the collaborative process of nation building. And spoiler alert, yes, Nate Silver does have something to do with all of this. First, let's get the measure of what a poll is. Polls have been around for quite a while, since the 1820s in the US by some measures, but the ease and interest in conducting them has led to a contemporary surge in their popularity. Today, polls are largely conducted via telephone. A polling company calls some numbers, often dialing randomly, and when people pick up, the pollster tries to get them to answer a few questions. Do you know what Medicare for all is? I do. Do you support it? Heck yeah. So how did that grow in prevalence to the point where the data it generates dominates the news? Well, polls have always been important. They capture public opinion, and that's kind of what politics is all about. What do the people want? What do they want their public servants to accomplish? But in 2008, something happened. An upstart statistician aggregated a bunch of polls and correctly forecasted 49 out of 50 states in the U.S. presidential election. He had a repeat performance in 2012, calling an Obama win 92% likely when other outlets said it was too close to call. These dramatic successes seemingly justified the reliability of a data-based approach and helped usher in an era of polling boosterism. The upstart statistician at the center of it all? You guessed it, Nate Silver. You might know Silver from 538, his New York Times blog, named after the number of votes in the Electoral College, but he was a baseball analyst who was influenced by Sabre metrics before he was a political commentator. In 2003, he developed an algorithm called PICOTA, or the Player Empirical Comparison and Optimization Test Algorithm, which, quote, forecasts Major League Baseball player performance. It's marketed by Baseball Prospectus, for which Silver was managing partner until 2009 as a fantasy baseball product. Silver's political forecasting successes, built on his experience crunching sports numbers and playing poker, made him a respected election sage. Barack Obama called him my rock, my foundation. John Stewart called him Lord and God of the algorithm. And so, alongside such high-profile endorsements, forecasting began to dominate election reporting, becoming the notable hook upon which pundits would hang their hat of pontification. Understanding the election cycle began to increasingly mean understanding polls and the forecasts based on them. Forecasting, by the way, means looking at data gathered from past events and describing, with clear and varying degrees of likelihood, what could happen in the future. That's different from prediction which is claiming that something will happen because of any number of factors, like, say, your tea leaves settle in a certain way. So pollsters like Silver forecast rather than predict. In a 2019 paper for the journal Journalism, Benjamin Toth, a professor at the University of Minnesota's Journalism School, mentions what he calls the Nate Silver effect. Quote, an overconfidence in election outcomes rooted in a reliance on quantitative measures of public opinion. And while it's true that Silver's approach had some, well, upside, he wasn't the sole cause of forecasting's now familiar ubiquity. Silver is both a cause and a symptom of larger circumstances. Polls in the forecast derived from them solve a number of problems faced by political reporters and pundits. We're going to talk about three. Airtime, objectivity, and drama. 
first, the 24-hour news cycle is hard to fill. Luckily, there are lots of polls. Everyone has one. They're relatively cheap and easy to conduct, as is polling aggregation and forecasting to a degree, especially if you're not super concerned about being right. So good news for pundits who need to fill hours a day. Second, polls help commentators address demands that they be objective. Forecasting provides a veneer of disinterest because pundits are talking about outcomes based on the prevalence of certain opinions, which have been measured empirically through polling. There's a whole video to be made questioning if and how polling is objective, but this isn't that video. And third, forecasting is exciting, especially when there's conflicting data. The horse race frame allows pundits to treat election campaigns like a sports event. Who has good chances and is in the lead? And who's the dark horse candidate? It's thrilling and easy to understand. And most importantly, it sells. Audiences love it. Listening to a detailed explanation of someone's environmental protection platform turns out audiences like that less. This, of course, guides what ends up on TV and in newspapers, which is not to say that there is no hard-hitting wonky journalism, just less of it. And it's harder to focus on what with all the needles, gauges, scatter plots, and histograms. So we get upside and chances and neck and neck because forecasting frames politics as a sport. It enables a focus on who is behind, who may pull ahead, and who could deliver a stunning upset. But but treating politics like a competition has consequences. When pundits focus on campaign strategy or circumstance, election coverage can lose focus on less entertaining but more crucial coverage of candidates' policies. Focusing on how many times a candidate visits Ohio and the impact that that has on their numbers, or if they gaff and how they poll after, is time not spent on how each candidate feels about the American prison system, or what they'll do to address wealth inequality, student loan debt, or the climate crisis. Upside may forecast monster stats, but rarely offers an explanation why. Is it because that candidate is less well-known? Or because their view on healthcare aligns with voters but is underreported? What is their view on healthcare? If their healthcare policy becomes law, how would citizens be affected? What about naturalized non-citizen immigrants? And also, mountains of cognitive research, we'll put some in the description, shows how the metaphors we use guide our thinking and our actions. Talking about politics as a team sport or a competition between ideological avatars reinforces devotion to a side. It causes constituents to lose focus on conditions shared amongst all voters and reinforces a devotion to a team, transcending concern for practical outcomes. None of this is to say that polling and forecasting are bad and that everyone should stop. As we mentioned, politics is about public opinion. Knowing the public's opinion is important. But a feedback loop can develop when polls poll an uninformed public and forecasts developed from those public opinion polls influence the same public's opinion, which is then polled again to produce another forecast and so on and so forth in an ever polling Ouroboros. Without broad public discussion of platform details, there's little foundation to that which is polled. People have scant reason for feeling how they do, it's just how they feel. So the bottom falls out of the forecast, further reinforcing forcing the team devotion dynamic. Why do you root for this candidate? Well, they're on your team. Why is that your team? Because you root for them. If we wanted to change this state of affairs, there are some things newsmakers and news consumers can do. Pundits, explain the issues. Explain the differences and similarities between candidates from a policy perspective and help citizens understand how they'd be impacted by different outcomes. Use all the motion graphics you need to make it exciting, but make forecasting the exception, not the rule. Help us citizens understand that outcomes matter Matter. Rely less on polling figures and competitive at-odds rhetoric. The presidential election is not a sports match. It is not a reality TV show. Get rid of the countdown clocks. We are all stressed out enough already. Consumers, you have it even harder. This exciting statistics-based horse race coverage with the charts and graphs and odds and chances? Turn it off. I know, I have a hard time too. Instead, read some policy papers, and if you can't find some from your favorite candidate, that's a bad sign. Learn what each candidate wants to do for the country and then formulate your opinion. The person you end up agreeing with the most might not be ahead in the polls, and that can be discouraging. But with your informed involvement, they could be. These changes are difficult to make, it's true, but look at it this way. In the current political climate, change has big upside.